Our next speaker is uh, Jérémy Howick, and he told me yesterday that he was from Montreal, and his parents are still in Montreal, and they have a cottage close to my place, then you will come to see me in Sherbrooke, I'm sure, from Oxford to Sherbrooke. Thank you very much. Merci, Serge.
that's a huge effect. I, I mean, if the mirror was up here doing this, they could do a much better job and induce no placebo, placebo effects. That's proof. Placebo effects can work. We don't need to prove that. So move on to the second one. Do they require deception? The first study I'm aware of of non-deceptive placebo use is Park and Kobe. They took some patients with some serious anxiety disorders and gave them placebo pills, told them they were placebos, and they still seemed to work. The problem was these patients were anxious and a bit paranoid. They thought the doctors were lying. So they thought the doctors were giving them a placebo, but really giving, said they were giving them a placebo, but the patients thought they were actually giving them a real pill. So you, you can't trust that study too much, but it is interesting. Since that one, there have been a number of randomized trials. This is one that Ted's done, where he said patients were randomized to either open-label placebo pills, presented as, I quote, placebo pills made of an inert substance, like sugar pills, that have been shown in clinical studies to produce significant improvement in symptoms through mind-body self-healing processes, or no treatment controls with the same quality of interaction with providers. So, there's no question this was an ethical trial. The patients did understand they were receiving just sugar pills. I submit that saying this is also, which is okay, some kind of positive suggestion. But the best evidence, according to the evidence-based medicine community, comes from systematic reviews of randomized trials. So um, Ted did the hard work. I did the kind of easy stuff. Uh, the, I did a, it's coming out for publication soon, together with other authors, um, some of them are here a systematic review of randomized trials of non-deceptive placebos. So what did I find? The methods we searched, searched six databases. Um, with, we thought of a kind of cool search strategy. We screened about 248 studies. And two authors independently assessed to whether they were included or not and did the data extraction. Oh, that's all here. Um, we found five randomized trials. We also contacted clinical experts um, with 260 participants. The conditions tested were IBS, depression, allergic rhinitis, back pain, and ADHD. We found a moderate risk of bias. I'll get back to this in a minute, but very low heterogeneity. So um, here's a forest plot. I won't go into details for those of you who get bored by this kind of stuff. Basically, this black diamond because it lies to the right of this vertical line means that the effect was statistically significant. It's also arguably clinically relevant. <coughs> how they might work, there are three mechanisms, potential mechanisms. We don't know how they work right now. These are three plausible mechanisms. Expectancy, if the open label placebo is accompanied by a positive message. Unconscious conditioning or embodied con consciousness. I won't take any questions about embodied consciousness. I don't really understand it. <laughs> uh, that's true. Uh, so, the conclusions. Open label placebos appear to be effective for some things, as effective as other kinds of placebos. I, have a, I can tell you why as well. But of course, like with all studies, no study is perfect. This one's not either. The study was quite small. Um, there was bias, lack of blinding, and we can disentangle the uh, different effects of open label placebos to the positive messages. Now, what are the main limitations? I think there are three. First of all, the effect size is quite big, as big as um, regular placebos in clinical trials that are delivered partially, deceptively. That's reason to be suspicious. But the two main, the, the two main ones are, one, failure to blind, Patients who are not being treated know they're not being treated. I think this might be offset by Hawthorne effects. So whereas the failure to blind might, you might think that will reduce the effect size, potential Hawthorne effects in an untreated groups could lead to a decrease in effect size. The other objection that came up in, in the reviewer comments was that open label placebos come as a package. It's not just the open label placebo pill, it's the contact with the practitioner, it's the positive message. Some of those things are equal in both groups, some of them are not. And now, my reply is that the fact that open label placebos come as a package, not just one simple thing, applies to all treatments. So here's a quote from a paper that took me 10 years to write on defining placebos. All treatments come as a package. The fact that all treatments, 
including apparently simple ones, have several treatment features, is obscured by ordinary language. For example, it is common to refer to Prozac as a treatment when what is actually meant is therapy involving fluoxetine hydrochloride, and that also includes other ingredients in the pill, the liquid with which the pill is swallowed, the beliefs and expectations of the patient, the label of the pill, etc., etc. So this is not really a, uh, a really good objection. All treatments are complex. The important thing is to describe what we've done carefully so that patients can benefit from them. And these trials describe the intervention very well, better on average than most drug trials. This is just how they describe it. This is a table from the paper. Um, the other thing we should do is look at, well, what are the benefits of adding a positive message? What is the right language to use when delivering an open legal placebo so that the responses are maximized? So we're looking into this with a common review of the benefits of expectations or trying to induce expectations and enhanced empathy. So the conclusion of the systematic review, oh, this is a preliminary results from the Cochrane review, giving a positive message doesn't just affect psychological outcomes, it also affects physiological outcomes. So what next? What's the next step for this stuff? Well, I don't think it's what next, but how next. I think we already have enough evidence to start using what we have to benefit patients. How can we do this? There's three ways. One, policy, public, and collaboration we're doing here. So basically, I count this conference as, as policy. We're trying to change people's perceptions about placebos. So that what we know about placebos, we know they can help people. How can we use that knowledge to improve patient care? Presumably that that's what we're all interested in. We've also started with others, um, a, a, the Oxford Empathy Program. I forgot to put the care manage, uh, Claudia's name, I'm sorry about that. But it was, um, that also, Skipping policy, we can go directly to the public. I'm, I've got a popular science book coming out in October where I'm trying to take the research I've done and that you've done and translate it, no doubt badly, in a way that the public might understand a bit better than they understand our geeky academic papers. Lastly, the, the collaborations. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do this without collaborations with, um, as I Claudia, Karen, Felicity, who's sitting right by back there um, in Southampton. Um, Katya Reach, is she here today? I mean, she, yeah, okay. um, we're doing a, a course, a short course on May 3rd in Oxford. And then Charlotte, Luana, and others were writing a paper on open label placebo. So these collaborations make it all possible. But just as my research on the ethics of placebos in clinical practice required collaboration or marriage between philosophy and epidemiology. Moving this forward requires collaboration between our ourselves. So feel free to get in touch. I'm happy to share my data, um, provided it's already been published and so on, and, and work with all of you. So feel free to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. I have a question about embodied cognition. <laughs> now, I just want to ask you, so, if we have enough evidence, uh, according to your account, to propose open-label placebos to patients, but then what you have shown is that they have to be carefully introduced in clinical trials. So do you think that clinicians have to be instructed in ways in which they have to prescribe open label placebos eventually, since the positive message seems to be critical within that package? It's a very good question, thank you. So first of all, I'm talking about clinical practice, not clinical trials. And we are all researchers, but just as you declared, Marco, you have no conflicts of interest. What you meant was financial conflicts of interest. We all have conflicts of interest, and as academics, our conflict is to always say, we've got to do more research. There's already enough evidence out there to implement the benefits of this. Um, and good doctors have always used it. Ted, Ted used it for 50, well, sorry, he's too old, now, but I, you know, too young for that, for years. Every good doctor is already doing it. Um, 
why is it considered unethical? So do I think you know we need more? We already have enough evidence to implement this stuff. Um, there's a table in our um, review that, you, that lists the words used, so doctors can copy that. It's never going to work for everybody. Someone yesterday, I think it was, I forget who said that nothing's going to work for everybody. No matter what you do, it might harm one person, but on average, it will help. Does that answer your question? One more question. Jeremy, thanks a lot. Um, I just want to say I, that I think it's way too early to adopt open label placebo as any kind of standard practice in healthcare. We're talking about less than 200 patients in five different conditions that have been treated this way. We have no idea how long this lasts. We have no idea how to taper it. We don't know the interaction it may have with drugs. And the most important thing is that we can't trust doctors to do it because they think it's, you just give them a pill and say, here, take this. It's, 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 if it's an honest placebo, you take it, do an honest placebo, or I don't want to talk about exception placebo, but that's not going to work. There's got to be a sensitivity about what we're doing about it. And I don't think we know as a community. I certainly don't know personally what are the active ingredients and how it works. So I just want to say, I like your enthusiasm and wanting to push this forward. I have it also, but I'm trying to restrain myself because we really do need more evidence from many places and many conditions. That's my personal opinion. Um, I'd ask that you're responding to my opinion. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad you brought that up. And so I, when I say we have enough evidence to implement it, I don't mean we should do it stupidly. Um, and you said, Ted, yesterday that most drugs, the NNT for statins is about, about 80 something. 1.3% actually benefit in the latest New England Journal trial. So that those are the drugs are already doing this way. This, the, the first thing I'll say is that the second thing is when I talk about open label placebos, I mean as a package. Um, they come as a package. It's not just a pill. I also count the positive expectations. They you know the rewards used. So I mean, what I meant by implementing this stuff, I mean implementing placebo research in general, including open label placebos in particular, with a bit more research. Um, the, the, the last thing is, yes, of course, we've got to do it, do it properly and sensibly, just like we shouldn't even introduce new drugs without uh, providing guidelines and so on. But the, the, paper, the papers I published, this one in the Cochrane Review, contain tables with the words, and I've got plans for follow-up studies with Felicity to put a finer point in it, and I don't think we need 50 years more research to, to do that. So basically, I, I agree we need a bit more and do it sensibly. Yes. Five years minimum, I'll tell you. <laughs> I defer to your authority and experience. I defer to your enthusiasm. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.